thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm excited to be here and tell you about how we're applying direct RNA sequencing to nascent RNA in order to learn more about RNA processing. So we learned yesterday that RNA splicing is incredibly complex. So you have lots of introns that can be in human genes. And these require exons that are far apart to come together and, um, and be joined. Uh, we also know that there's degenerate sequence information at these introns, so it's hard for the splicing machinery to know where one intron starts and one ends. And not only that, we have multiple different isoforms that can result from the same gene. And so the machinery has to know exactly which transcript to make every time. And this is really important because if this whole process is going wrong, it can lead to severe diseases. And so I use this gene as an example because if splicing is disrupted here, it can lead to muscular dystrophy. So a lot of what we know about splicing and the mechanism of how it works is, um, is from in vitro splicing assays where, um, where uh, s uh, researchers are studying splicing within a test tube. Um, but really, we know that splicing in vivo is very different. So in vivo, splicing happens about 10 times faster. And we also know that splicing factors will interact with the, uh, uh, the transcription machinery um, within cells. And so we, we know that um, these uh, interactions are happening within the cell, and then also that the um, transcription machinery is, um, when it's mutated, it can lead to severe splicing defects. And that also the rate of transcription can regulate alternative splicing decisions. So it's clear that these two are really coupled. And also we know that splicing is actually happening during transcription. So I'm sh showing an electron micrograph on the right here of um, these are genes from a Drosophila embryo. And DNA is on the vertical axis and RNA is being transcribed. Oh dear. And what we can see is that the DNA is here on this vertical axis, RNA is being transcribed off the DNA, and loops are forming within this RNA. And these are introns that are in the process of being spliced. And so we can see that splicing here is really co-transcriptional. And so the goal of my thesis was to develop a tool that would allow us to monitor RNA processing as transcripts are produced, and in order to really look at this, how this is happening in living cells. And so I'm going to tell you today about how I developed this method, and then about um, what we learned about the kinetics of splicing, the order of splicing, and then about how alternative splicing is related to this. So most studies that have looked at the relationship between transcription and splicing have done so using time. They measure the time that it takes to transcribe an intron and then splice it. Um, but we thought that maybe it would be better to actually look at distance. And so this is uh, based off a technique that my advisor developed during her postdoc called native elongating transcript sequencing, or NetSeq, where we're purifying nascent RNA that is, uh, is um, being transcribed and then sequencing from the very free prime end. And if you align this to the genome, it tells you the position of RNA polymerase two across the genome. But you can see that we're missing some information here. So what I wanted to do is be able to uh, make a long read application of this approach so that we can not only look at just the three prime end of the reads, but also see whether splicing has occurred. And so one thing I have to do for this is to purify nascent RNA. And so one strategy is through cellular fractionation, which enriches for, which enriches for RNAs that are localized to the site of transcription. Um, so this is, works through a series of centrifugation steps and, and lysis to purify chromatin that's associated uh, and the RNA that's associated to chromatin. And then another strategy is through metabolic labeling where 4SU, um, which is a uridine analog, gets incorporated into RNA as, uh, as the RNA is, is made. And through biotinylation and streptavid and pull down, you can purify those RNAs that are recently transcribed. And so what I found was that actually combining these two strategies is much better than each on their own and really en enriches for the benefits of both of these two strategies and, and minimizes the amount of background. So I decided to combine these two and, and in this way I purify the nascent RNA. So uh, now I wanted to perform long read sequencing and as you can imagine as I'm part of this breakout I decided to do direct RNA sequencing. But there is one caveat is that nascent RNA doesn't have a poly A tail. And so to get around this, we added a poly A tail enzymatically using poly A polymerase. And um, I found that this is actually a very efficient reaction. And um, so in this way, we're able to capture all of the nascent RNAs within the sample. And then I proceed through the rest of the library preparation um, using the standard uh, Oxford nanopore adapter. And this gets threaded through the nanopore from the three prime to five prime direction. So in this way, we're sequencing these nascent RNAs from the three prime end first, and this allows me to really look at um, the, that 
three prime end of the nascent RNA that is telling the, where the position of the polymerase is. A great benefit of this is that I don't rely on PCR amplification, which can heavily bias with splicing because it'll preference the short spliced RNAs over the long unspliced RNAs. And just some key statistics of this data is that I get around 100,000 usable reads and about 10, 25% are greater than a KB. So when I put this all together, we get a full technique and we decided to call this NanoCOP for nanopore analysis of co-transcriptional processing. Here are some example nanocop reads aligning to the AUP1 gene in human K562 cells. So there's a lot that you can notice here. A few things I want to point out is that we get reads that end within the middle of the gene. And so these are the reads that we think are coming from RNAs that are still being transcribed. And we also get really interesting combinations of splicing. So some reads have every intron spliced, some reads have no splicing, and then there are some that have really interesting combinations that can tell us about the order and patterning of RNA splicing. To convince you that we're looking at nascent RNA, I'm just showing a pie chart of where all of our three prime ends align. And so you can see that when we um, add artificially add the poly-A polymerase, most of the ends are aligning within uh, the gene body. But when we don't add the poly-A polymerase, most are ending at poly-A sites. And then we also use poly uh, nanopolish to look at the length of poly-A tails. And when we endogenously add these poly-A tails, we can actually see a length difference between those within gene bodies versus those at the endogenous sites. So really, it tells us that we can distinguish the artificial tails from the endogenous tails by their length. So the first question that I wanted to answer is how far does uh, RNA polymerase II transcribe before splicing? And so here's a read aligning to a gene with three introns, and a few things that we can pull out is the approximate position of POL2, and then also the introns that it spans. And so the two pieces of information that I really want to pick up here is the distance transcribes, the distance between the three prime end of the intron and the three prime end of the nascent RNA, and then also whether splicing has occurred. And so this is the data from a single read, but I want to look at what's happening globally. And so here's data from the human K562 cells. And what I want to point your attention to is um, on the x-axis is the distance transcribed before splicing. And I've binned these into 100 nucleotide bins. And within each of these bins, I have calculated the percent of molecules that are spliced. And so in this case, you can see that in human cells, very little splicing is actually happening when Paul 2 is within two kilobases from the intron. So really suggesting that transcription isn't in close physical proximity to splicing. But we decided to use a different organism and looked at Drosophila melanogaster. So we did the same experiment in Drosophila S2 cells, and now we see something completely different. So in this case, uh, splicing uh, or transcription is a lot closer to the splicing um, or to the intron when splicing is occurring. So Paul 2 is about uh, when it's 1 kb away, about 25% of introns are spliced, and at 2 kb away, about 50% of introns are spliced. And so you're probably wondering why this is, but Drosophila has a much different genome structure, and so about um, the median intron size in, in Drosophila is 70 nucleotides. And so uh, when I separated these really short introns from the long introns, we can see that these short introns are more rapidly spliced, and these are uh, likely what's contributing to that rapid splicing dynamics in Drosophila. So I showed you that we can detect some differences in splicing um, in, these, in these cell types, but what if we actually perturb the splicing reaction? Can we detect that in the data? So we used a splicing inhibitor called platyanolide B, which interferes with splicing before this first catalytic step. So it, it really interfering before the first uh, cleavage event. And so when we treat cells with PLA-B and look at the data by nanocop, we can see that there's uh, very little splicing occurring in, in this data, so less than 10% of reads actually have any evidence of splicing. And this is all of the data, but what if we do that same plot and look at co-transcriptional splicing? Uh, now again, we can confirm that uh, PLA-B is really interfering with splicing here. So in DMSO, we can see more, the more rapid splicing kinetics um, in the Drosophila, but in PLA-B, we can see that there's very little splicing here, suggesting that it's really inhibiting the splicing reaction and co-transcriptional splicing. This, so this really suggests that PLA-B is a potent and global inhibitor of co-transcriptional splicing, and also that it's validating that nanocop is detecting early um, uh, or early processing dynamics. So another question that I really wanted to ask is whether or not splicing follows the order of transcription. And this is interesting because if transcription and splicing are coupled, then you would assume that splicing might just follow the order of transcription as it's happening, as it's being transcribed. 
Here is data from a single gene. So this is um, the EIF1 gene in human K562 cells. And with Illumina short read data, you can see that all three introns are constitutively spliced. Uh, but in the long read nascent RNA data, we can see that uh, the third intron tends to be spliced before the upstream two. And this is really suggesting that at least in this uh, example of this one gene, splicing is not following the order of transcription. So we wanted to look at this more globally. And so now I'm plotting um, all reads that span pairs of introns and looking at cases where the upstream intron is spliced um, before the downstream intron, um, or cases where the downstream intron is spliced before the upstream intron. And you can see that in human cells, it's really 50% of 50% uh, for each, um, suggesting that transcription direction isn't really dictating the order of splicing. Uh, so we also wanted to look at Drosophila and saw something uh, different again. And so in this case, we see that there's more, more of the time the upstream intron is spliced before the downstream intron. And we think that this has to do with those rapid splicing kinetics in Drosophila that just tend to um, happen um, faster and so more um, synchronous wi with the direction of transcription. But with long read data, we're not just limited to looking at intron pairs. We can also look at um, more complex combinations. So in this case, I'm looking at all reads that span three introns. And on the left is the cartoon of all of the different combinations that can occur. And on the right is the proportion of time that we see each of these combinations. And in Drosophila, again, we can see that splicing tends to follow the order of transcription, where this first intron, uh, uh, when the first intron is spliced, that seems to be the highest proportion of time, or when the first two are spliced. In humans, we again see something different. And so what I want to point your attention to here are these middle cases, where when the middle intron is different from the outside two. And um, in both of these cases, um, the proportion of these molecules are a lot, a lot smaller. And so what we think that this is telling us is that introns that, neighbor, um, in introns that neighbor each other tend to have similar splicing dynamics. And so this could suggest that splicing is more coordinated or cooperative in human cells, which makes sense based on um, how splicing is working across exons. So last piece of data I want to show you here is um, work from a postdoc in our lab, Karine Choquet, where she took the nanocop data and wanted to see whether in transit neighbor alternative exons tend to have different uh, splicing dynamics. So she compared in transit neighbor constitutive exons versus in transit neighbor alternative exons and found that the ones that neighbor constitutive exons tend to have more uh, rapid splicing dynamics. And that also when she, oh dear. Also, when she looked at the order of splicing, she saw that those constitutive exons tend to be um, spliced before the alternative exons, really suggesting that alternative splicing seems to have more of a delay. So to summarize what I showed you, we learned that NanoCOP directly sequences nascent RNA in order to observe patterns of early RNA processing, that uh, Paul 2 transcribes several kilobases before intron splicing in human cells, that intron splicing doesn't always follow the order of transcription and tends to be coordinated in human cells, and that introns that neighbor alternative exons tend to have delayed splicing kinetics. Um, so I just want to speak briefly about what we hope to do in the future. So we're really hoping that we can get longer reads and higher coverage with nanocop data, allowing us to look at interactions that are um, longer range and also uh, at individual genes. We also hope to look at the different splicing factors and see how these are involved in splicing kinetics and order. And that lastly, now that we have a tool to look at both transcription and splicing, we want to be able to perturb transcription and see how it's directly impacting splicing. So I really want to thank um, my lab and my advisor, Sterling Churchman. I also want to thank uh, Karine Choquet, uh, who helped me um, in the last stages of this project, both experimentally and computationally. And then I also want to thank uh, the Oxford Nanopore community. Um, just in general, it was really daunting starting out on this project, but I had a lot of support um, figuring out which experimental uh, steps to do and also computational. And uh, thank you all for listening.